Can you believe that we discontinued the greatest battle rifle on earth? I mean, come on. Gentlemen, we're talking about the most lousy service rifle of all time. And you know what we tried to do with this thing and try and make it better? We just dumped it to a giant heavy ass metal chassis. <laughs> Let's just see what it can do though. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the most lousy gun tube channel this side, probably of the Mississippi, featuring the world's most lousy service rifle of all time, baby. A gun kept on life support since its introduction. The most beautiful disaster of a firearm. Admit it, she's hot. It's a fire looking gap. Like, if the Mark 14 were a chick, you would have to add a page to the hot, crazy girl matrix chart. It's like the most horse girl gun that moonlights as a hairdresser of all time. It's like drop dead hot, but it's gonna be an insanely high maintenance piece that's either gonna put you in an early grave or lead to a nasty breakup. She's gonna take the wallpaper, bro. She's gonna take the light fixture. She's gonna take all the cell phone chargers with her when she leaves. The type to hide your keys in the ceiling and then have the audacity to help you look for them. I'm talking street tendencies, man. Just utter chaos. That's what they thrive on. And you know what's wild? Still to this day, 2024 AD, folks are out here dropping this dreaded abomination into a chassis worth more than half the gun itself. But it's okay. A gown of blue Loctite will hold your zero for the next 17 rounds, King. Listen. Cody Curry here, guys, and this is 110 Sass Actual. Friends and kings and queens, hosses and hossets. I think I'm out of lines. Anyways, with your help, guys, growing this channel, we have crested over a half million subscribers. Over 500,000 of you absolute cool cats joining me with these weekly shenanigans. Joining you on the toilet each week is an honor, seriously, guys. And it just gives me that warm and fuzzy feeling, you know? Just make sure to wipe. Your coworkers will appreciate that, I promise. Now, a weapon system, either hated or loved, with just absolutely nothing in between, it would seem. Today, we beat a dead horse, but with a twist. This one does the thing. Now, I was lucky enough to have this opportunity to spend this month's mortgage sending love and lead down range with this thing, chambered in three quarters per bang for you guys to watch the fiscally irresponsible kind of guy I am. Have some fun, drain the bank account. So friends, let's talk about the Mark 14. But first, let's rewind to the beginning. We're talking 1944, 1945 kind of times. Well, it was undoubtedly the best battle rifle at the beginning of the war. No ifs, ands, buts about it. The M1 Grand did have its shortcomings, and folks were becoming, well, rapidly aware of that. While it outclassed pretty much everything in World War II, minus the FG-42 and STG-44, which were phenomenal rifles, but guys, they were just fielded in extremely small numbers, and in the grand scheme of things, kind of just making their appearance a little too late. A little too late, a little too little, little late, little too, yes. Anyways, the M1, it just, guys, it just kind of lacked some areas. The recoil of the 30-06 cartridge, guys, it's pretty solid. Well, it's, it's definitely manageable. You have to think on a bigger scale than just shooters that can manage recoil. Well, being a great shooter and you can manage recoil is a very important feat for somebody who's fighting for their life. It's not exactly what defines a great soldier. There's been numerous, I'm sure, numerous Medal of Honors, just Distinguished Service Crosses, Stars, and whatever kind of medals you get for being an absolute king, a hero that changes the outcome of the battlefield. 
there's probably some of those dudes that didn't qualify expert in marksmanship. They're just kings with balls. I don't even know how they can even get out of bed every day because they're so huge, but they're still out there changing the situation and saving lives. So as a whole, you got to think big picture. A more punishing recoil just isn't ideal. Hence why a general purpose infantry, hence why the general infantry perp, Hence why the general purpose infantry rifle and the cartridge it shoots have continuously gotten smaller and smaller over the past century. Second, guys, there's no detachable box magazine. By now, everybody can understand the unparalleled advantages to a box mag versus an end block clip. Yeah, other than that delicious... Mm, nice. It's literally, it's all pros. Give your average dude both rifles. The M14 is going to win eight days a week. And honestly, both platforms really suffer from the same issues ultimately. Yes, one has a box mag, one comes from a clip, but we're talking accuracy and POI shift. Swollen wooden stocks, barrels touching just too many parts on the weapon system, throwing off the harmonics, the list goes on. But nonetheless, still an upgrade over the M1. And a pretty fair, I would call it, a decent bridge between the BAR and the M1. Just that gun that kind of bridged the gap from the squad automatic rifle to the super long, heavy hitting battle rifle that was the M1. Now, there was definitely better rifles available at that time. And they decided to go with this M1. We're talking about the FAL here. Definitely an overall way better battle rifle than the M14, but that's another rabbit hole. We'll get to that maybe one of these days. Now, the M14, its first real taste of combat was in the jungles. It was in Vietnam. So its first real test came on the platform of 150 degree jungles and like 10,000% humidity, conservatively speaking, of course. Wow, it did a pretty fair job kind of holding its own there. It quickly became apparent that this battle rifle was well, it was overkill for the job. It was heavy. There was more recoil. The average soldier appreciates less recoil in a less heavy weapon. Overkill, you say? Well, hear this, nearly 80%, 80% of all firefights in Vietnam were at 32 yards or less. That's less than 100 feet. I don't know about you guys, but I train handguns at that range quite often. A gigantic and heavy, unwieldy, just battle rifle, just, guys, it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense. In fact, I kind of almost consider it a liability. This type of warfare, it was nothing like the battlefields of Europe in that European theater. Warfare, it was very asymmetrical. Most engagements, guys, they were near ambushes in the landscape. It was dense with grass, brush, just, just greenery. It was honestly worse than a lot of the Pacific theater the Marines went through as far as jungle warfare goes. And it was quite often in the Pacific that the Marines, they wanted to carry an M1 carbine over the M1. They simply didn't need this huge general purpose battle rifle, something small, something light, something you can carry a lot more ammo with, higher mag capacity, is just what they preferred many times. Now, not all the time in the Pacific, but it definitely showed up a lot more in the Pacific than it did in the European theater on front lines combat. So, one of the shortest main infantry rifles ever lived, but also a really long living one, it was benched, okay? Talking 1965 to 1967, the M16A1 started to make its appearance, and after, well, a lot of initial bugs, some drama, and really straight up sabotage that cost Americans their lives, the M16 became the infantry rifle. But that didn't discourage the old M14. No, 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 I didn't hear no bell, it says. In very, very small numbers, the M14 was still being fielded in Vietnam, mostly by non-combatants and cool guy, high-speed kind of dudes that had their choice of which weapon they wanted to take. This was the birth of the sniper variant of the M14 and what led to what we have here today, the Mark 14 Mod Zero. The M14 would never again be issued widely as a general purpose rifle, but instead, Guys, we put some perfume on that pig and we just sent it throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, even into the 2010s. The M14 was never fully abandoned. Instead, companies like Sage International and Knight's Armament were contracted to make the M14 relevant again with just simple small things like optic mounts and small Picatinny rails to what we have here, the Sage International chassis, a completely new take on this old girl giving it a completely new life. You see, when the global war on terror kicked off, the military was scrambling for that special purpose rifle. 
a gun that could just bridge that gap between the bolt gun and the M4. And Lord, did the military try. If you look back, there were so many different variants of what we had and what ultimately became today. They took those guns and I said, hey, instead of acquiring new stuff and spending all of this extra money, why don't we try and bridge that gap between the sniper role and infantrymen with what we already have? Things like the Squad Advanced Marksman Rifle, the Sam R. The Mark 12, you guys have heard of the Mark 12. These things were born out of this new generation of war, out of necessity. Essentially, they ultimately were just heavily modified old M16s, again, that were just rotting in the armory. Everybody was already pretty much using M4s for the most part. A lot of the Marines were still carrying M16A4s with the big old musket 20 inch barrel, which did great, but the 14 and a half inch is just much more wieldy, you know? It's just a much nicer rifle to carry, to shoot, and especially in urban warfare environments. Now these variants, the SAM-R wasn't really fielded in huge numbers, however the Mark 12 definitely had a much more prolific life, but even an accurized M16 still lacked what the military needed in this new desert warfare. See, urban warfare was pretty much exclusive to places like Fallujah and Ramidi when we're talking big standard infantry forces, but outside of that, firefights were not like your typical Vietnam engagement in the jungles. In fact, it was quite the opposite of our previous major conflict that was Vietnam. I would say most of the current doctrine during the global war on terror came from Vietnam. It was stuff written in the 60s and 70s, the things that we learned there, completely different from Europe. And that was what was relevant in the Middle East, the engagements. They were often 10 times the distance. In fact, I did some research and found that in Afghanistan, over half of the firefights took place over 300 yards. That's literally three times the distance of Vietnam. So warfare had changed. And with that comes the not so peak technology of the 1950s, the M14 again. Now, what's different about this new and improved Mark 14 is this chassis system made by Sage International. Instead of adopting an entirely new platform, that's very expensive to do. There's testing, there's trials. It's just, it costs millions of dollars to do that. So they turned to the M14. Even though there were guns out there with real combat time on them and hands of high speed dudes getting great reviews like the LaRue OBR and the Knights SR25, but it was a decision made by somebody with some stars on a helmet to dump, I don't know, a bajillion dollars into the M14 and make it great again. Or at least try. Let's first talk about how ridiculously attractive this thing is, because I don't want to dogpile on it just yet. I mean, bro, it's so ugly, it's hot, and it's so hot that it's just, it's just, it's, it's hot. Like, man, it's a really fine looking rifle, but again, guys, it's kind of one of those crazy women on that the crazy girl matrix chart. It's like the most horse girl hairdresser gun of all time. Again, it might unalive you, it might not, but I'm telling you it's gonna take your phone chargers when you kick it out. And then it's gonna help you look for your keys after she hit them in the vents. But you ask, what actually made the Mark 14 so dang lousy? Well, it's not inherently an unreliable rifle per se. From the standpoint of, does it go bang every time you tell it to? It actually does a fairly good job, but, that's about it. And by the time they were used on any real scale since 1965, they were so old and the data technology, guys, they were worn out. That poor girl never had a chance really at winning. The whole Mark 14 program was, it was kind of a disaster. It wasn't, it, it just did not roll out very well. And let's talk about it. While some came out great, they completely rebuilt these rifles. Basically, only the action was reused. We're talking barrels, all of the guts, op rods, everything. But some come out, extremely dreadful. I'm not kidding when I say more than just a handful went overseas with dang near smooth bore barrels from 1961 because some guy forgot to replace it or I don't know, didn't want to headspace and time it. Just dropped into a chassis, slapped it and said, man, I can fit so many tax dollars in this bad Larry. Let's keep them going. The biggest problem with the M14 was the point of impact shift, POI. The way that the M14 system drops into a Sage chassis ultimately was just with some screws some screws and a crush washer. And when those screws come loose, point of impact, guys, it's thrown way off. It was actually so common that guys used to carry bottles of blue Loctite around in their kit to help keep the chassis attached and maintain that POI. 
The Sage chassis also lacked any real bedding in the system, and the whole thing relied, again, on this barrel tension screw and a crush washer. The barrel, it's not even free float, really, so the harmonics are just, they're thrown way out of whack from its original configuration, and it just keeps going on and on. Pair that with the rigors of combat, and you legitimately have a firearm that I would consider a liability. See, here's the thing. If I can make good solid hits at 600 yards all day on a Tuesday, but on Saturday I'm 4 MOA high and 5 MOA to the left because I dropped it, I fell on some rocks or whatever, I used the weapon like a tool, like it was made to do, that legitimately makes your weapon system a liability for yourself, for your teammates. Ultimately, that's just not ideal. While some of these guns did come out 1 MOA, sometimes even sub MOA platforms with match ammo, it was just too inconsistent across the board. And when that point of impact shifts, you're kind of in bad shape. So ultimately guys, it was dumped. And the M110 was adopted in 2007 and large frame gasser, just AR-10, SR-25 platforms simply just outperform it in every category possible. Well, the military definitely still has these things rotting away in the armory and they get brought out to meme every once in a while. I really think it's safe to say that it's a platform that just won't make it back to the warfront anytime soon. SR-25 platform, any AR-10 platform, it's, it's simply more accurate and more rugged. So, gentlemen, I believe we have a wrap on the rise and demise and then the rise and then demise of the M14. I mean, it's a fun story and ultimately it's a really fun and iconic rifle. It stayed in service for decades, so it definitely deserves a spot on the wall. Well, it's probably the wall of shame. It's still a wall. So, guys, we are signing out here and say it with me. Run your gun and not your mouth, and we will catch you next time.